Hello, my name is Dean Contover. This is The Current Buzz. This is a new season for us, 2023 and 2024. Today we have Emily Donovan from the National Park Service uh, with us. And uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. So good uh, to be here. The first one of the season. So um, we're going to talk about something very interesting. We're going to talk about the National Park, yes, but basically there's a new display in town. And this is at the Morgan Cultural Center, and she will talk about it uh, in the ex extension of what's going on. Uh, but I, I just want to talk about the National Park Service um, in Lowell. There's a National Park, if you... If you don't know, there's a national park in Lowell. They have tours. They have canal rides. They have, go ahead. The trolley, the museum, the, the weave room. Yeah, the uh, folk festival. The folk that's, festival. Yeah. that's a huge one. Yeah, that's a huge one. So, yes, Lowell National Historical Park has been in Lowell since 1978. And our mission there is to interpret the Industrial Revolution and its legacies. So if you think about all those big mill buildings, you think about the power canal system. Um, but I think the big part of the story that we try to interpret there is this people story. Uh, and so the legacies includes, you know, people who have come to Lowell since the 1800s. It also includes people who were there before the 1800s. And uh, actually, when I was doing some research prior to the show, thinking about, you know, the park's foundation, um, when in the 1970s, when folks in the community wanted to get the Park Service to come to Lowell, they wanted to name it Lowell National Cultural Park. They wanted to focus on the people's stories. They right. thought that that's where the, the rich wealth of information right. was. Right. Um, and the Park Service says, we don't have a you know, moniker for cultural park, but historical park fits. So that's where we landed, Lowell National Historical Park. Right. And, and Paul Saunders was involved in that uh, yes. initially, and he got a, the ball rolling. Yes. Uh, it was the first time that they had a national park in a city, isn't it? Uh, there's a couple other okay. places, but it's the first time that we're really basing our story, a story of a National Park Service site kind of on a city itself. Okay. Um, so Lowell being one of the first planned industrial cities in the country, so that's really what makes us nationally significant, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but really focusing on the fact that we are a city and that is worth being part of the National Park Service system. Okay. Uh, is there any charges to go on a canal boat ride or? So there's a couple of things. Most of the park is free. Uh, we don't have that entrance fee like other right. traditional national parks. Right. Um, but if you did decide to come take a canal boat tour with us, which we are offering um, right now on the weekends through uh, Columbus Day weekend, and there is a fee for that, $12 for adults, $10 for seniors, $8 for students. And you can actually reserve online ahead of time for those. Oh, okay. And then year-round, our Boot Cotton Mills Museum, which has the working 1920s-era weave room on the first floor and a big museum set up on the second floor, uh, that is $6 for adults, $4 for seniors, $2 for students. I see. Okay. But you have a visitor center on 246 Market Street. That's a different building. That's a different building, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yeah. And it's, a, it's the kind of whole downtown section of Lowell um, is part of a historic district. So if you start your visit at the visitor center, um, you can park for free at the Hamilton Canal Innovation District parking garage. That's behind. It's behind, behind there, exactly. Behind. So And then you can stop by the visitor center, get your parking validated, you know, watch the intro film, get oriented. And then you actually walk through the downtown, which is the historic district downtown mm -hmm. uh, to get to the Boot Cotton Mills Museum or the Mogan Cultural Center. I see. Okay. That's, that's great. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say that, um, that you can also get your annual pass at the Visitor Center. Yes. Annual pass is $80, and for seniors at over 60 over 62 years old, it's $20. That is correct. So the, the National Park Service, the interagency, it's not just even just right. national parks, it's all federal lands. Right. You can get your um, interagency pass. And so $80 is for anybody, it's one year. Uh, it gets you and your car into any national park that has an entry fee right. for free. Um, and then for seniors, there's actually two different options. One is a $20 for one year, or you can get $80 and it's good for the rest of your life. Oh, wow. Um, and if you did, for example, get the $20 one, test it out for a year, and then you want to trade that in for $20 towards your lifetime pass, you can do oh, that you too. Can do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because it's really important to know because if you're going out west, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of national parks there, and uh, you could utilize that. Um, I utilized it, I think, at the Grand Canyon yep. and other places. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, but, and it's acceptable and they'll let you in. Absolutely. And But even locally, um, some places, you know, Cape Cod National Seashore, Acadia up in Maine, or Plum Island, which is a national wildlife refuge mm -hmm. um, in Newburyport. So there's even some local places where it can get you a, a well, great Well, sometimes seat. they won't let you on that national park um, uh, because of the piper. The piper, the plovers, yeah, that's yeah. true. It's so, true. So what I used to do, my strategy was... I'm going to the state park at the tip of Plum Island. Oh, that's good, to, yeah. They had to let me through. There you go. There, yeah, so, there's a great state park pass, too, available. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. so I just uh, want to talk about that. Yeah. So um, before we talk about the, the One City uh, Mini Culture exhibit, uh, how does someone become a park ranger? They have to be <laughs> a certain age. Uh, you, you don't necessarily have to be a certain age. Um, there, it's pretty neat, actually, that park rangers come from a variety of backgrounds, have okay. a variety of degrees. Um, so oftentimes, though, people start out as a seasonal employee in the National Park Service. Okay. So you kind of work for six months, uh, maybe at Lowell or maybe at the Grand Canyon. And so um, a lot of folks start out as seasonal park rangers. That's how I started in college. Okay. Um, so I started you know, during college doing that over the summers. And then eventually, you know, you get enough time in to be able to apply for those permanent positions places. Um, so there's a whole hiring Are there authority. positions now? I mean, because there's a lot of openings in yes. you know, positions all over the country for, so, for jobs. For jobs, yes. So uh, especially late September, which we're basically there, um, yeah. and early October, if people keep an eye on usajobs.gov, um, that's when a lot of the positions for seasonal rangers and recreation fee clerks and visitor services associates, all those basically mean a seasonal park ranger. Um, those will be flying. And the great thing about those um, job announcements is that you can see a job announcement and you can actually click, I want to apply to Lowell, I want to apply to Concord Minuteman, I want to apply to Boston National Historical Parks. So you can actually apply to multiple parks just with one click and just with uploading your resume and answering the questionnaire, basically. So there, there's a preponderance of se uh, seasonal people mm -hmm. in the summertime, mm -hmm. and then there's the regulars. Yes. What they call a permanent? Permanent, yeah. yeah. So we have some year-round staff members as yeah. well. Um, and uh, those folks are doing a lot of the projects like developing One City Many Cultures. Okay. They're doing a lot of digital media, different things. Um, but they all, almost everybody... Um, on the team, pretty much everybody started as a seasonal somewhere in the country and then has come to Lowell. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about the One City Many Cultures exhibit that's coming up September 23rd. Uh, it's open to the public. Yes. <laughs> um, and it's at the um, Morgan Cultural Center, and where is that? So the Morgan Cultural Center is located right next to Boarding House Park, if you're familiar with that, 40 French Street. Okay. Um, and, but again, I do recommend maybe starting your visit at the Visitor Center or um, parking at the Joseph Downs parking structure is kind of the two closest places to park. Um, and the Mogan Cultural Center houses this new exhibit, One City, Many Cultures. It also is a historic boarding house. So inside of the, um, the structure, we also have a boarding house exhibit that talks all about our mill girl history. It also is the home to the Center for Lowell History, which is the UMass Lowell Archive. And the Anchor Dance Troupe also practices in the Mogan. So, okay. so if you have any uh, uh, books like Jack Kerouac, first edition, signed, uh, the, the Morgan Center will take that book <laughs> off your hands. That's the Center for Lowell History. Yeah, That's yeah. UMass oh, Lowell. But oh, Tony okay. Sampas there is a Jack Kerouac uh, buff himself. So okay. he can help you out with that. Oh, okay. So, all right. So the, the one city, it's going to be a big event. This. That's what we're hoping for. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be a big event in the city. Uh, many cultures explain how it started, how long it's been going on, uh, and why. Yeah. So uh, we actually started the process of developing this exhibit about five years ago, a little bit before that to secure some funding. Um, so this exhibit is um, paid for. Actually, we're talking about those passes, uh, the annual passes and everything. Mm. There is a, a pool of money then that people, uh, excuse me, parks across the Park Service can apply for money to do projects that directly help the visitor experience. So directly have people understand our stories or, you know, be able to go on a trail something like that. 
So we secured some rec fee funding to do this exhibit. And the reason why we wanted to do this exhibit is because there had been, in that space previously, an immigration exhibit that was done in the 1980s. Okay. But the challenge was that, you know, time moves forward, yeah, right. the stories keep evolving in the city yeah, of good. Lowell, that's, which is a good thing. That's true. Yeah. And so the exhibit was about 30 years old, and so we decided it was time to update it. But we didn't want to just focus on immigration. We thought it was really important to think more just about that cultural story in Lowell because we know that many people have an immigration story attached somewhere in their family, but they also have, you know, my grandma's from Italy and my grandfather's from Ireland and, you know, my, uh, I married somebody who is Cambodian, right? So all of these stories coming together is really critical to how we tell the story of the landscape in Lowell. So you'll see some pictures on uh, the exhibit mm -hmm. uh, uh, later on. Uh, so, okay, so this has been going on five years? Five years. That's a long time. It is a long, long time. time. It is. To get and this exhibit. It is. Is I Smithsonian think... involved? Is, uh, um, not really, no. Not the really. Smithsonian, we are a Smithsonian affiliate, um, right. but we're, they weren't really involved. The reason why it took five years was because instead of just deciding, you know, the park's just gonna do this. Park staff are just gonna take it on. We'll work with a designer, we'll get it up there. We actually said, we don't know what we don't know about our community and about the people living in Lowell today. So we worked with uh, about 30 people over the course of the past five years and then hundreds of other people kind of associated um, with community input. So really having conversations early on in the process with different people about what is your Lowell experience? What is your family's story? Um, how could this exhibit better represent culture in Lowell? Mm -hmm. And we asked people to come to the table. We called it round table meetings. Literally, we sat around on, around the common room. called me. <laughs> <laughs> we called you later for that picture, okay. but yeah. yeah right. we, you know, we had people come back and then people fade in and out of that process, but it was really started as just very open-ended conversation. And from those very open-ended conversations, we were able to boil down kind of to three big ideas, um, which were building community, uh, cultural diversities and commonalities, and then mobility and transition. Mm -hmm. So by having those big themes, those big ideas, we're able to find stories all throughout history, all throughout the city today that kind of fit in um, to help us tell that Lowell story. And that Lowell story, is really the story of the area, and it's really the story of the country. Mm -hmm. um, so by approaching it more thematically, we were able to get a lot more stories in. Mm -hmm. What did you uh, uh, find out were the important cultures in law? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, I mean, th there's. it's really interesting to what say what are the important cultures in law. I think some of the things we found out were that we really, at the park, did not tell the story of our indigenous community very okay. well, yeah, that's, um, so that's true. yeah, so yeah. that was a big, um, that is a part of the exhibit, both the 12,000 years of human presence, but also um, people today who are, you know, in, in Lowell and in Chumsford and in the Merrimack Valley who are indigenous and they celebrate their culture and how do they do that today. Um, we also uncovered a lot about the kind of free black community, especially in the 19th century kind of around the abolition movement, okay. that 1850s era, but also um, people of color today in the city and what are their experiences, right. whether they are immigrating from a country or they have been here for decades and centuries and years. So um, that was a really important uncovering moment. And I think just in general, we also were finding that, you know, we talk about the, the kind of the big groups that have come through, but there are also a lot of other groups of people who maybe have come in smaller numbers, but that doesn't make it any less important. For right. example, the Jewish community in right. Lowell. Um, so or, or the Chinese community. Or the Chinese I mean, community in Lowell, that's featured. A lot of featured. people don't know that it was a, a, a major Chinese community There was, in absolutely. So it really is that. I know a little bit about the culture. That, that's yeah. really the neat part, though, is that it's, it's a lot of different communities and cultures have come into the city, and when you start looking at the kind of breadth of the history of it, you find that there's a lot of similarities across that, but there are also a lot of really neat specificities that make it a beautiful, different culture. And that's what we're hoping to feature in the exhibit. So, uh, half the people in Lowell, I mean, half the people in Chumsford are from Lowell, basically. Mm -hmm, true, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, so there's cultural richness in oh, yeah. Chumsford also. absolutely. That yeah, they and should be able to go and see this 
Yes, I think exhibit. that um, I think that people across kind of the Merrimack Valley will really see their communities and their stories represented. Um, but I, I we're, our hope is too, we're a national park, um, so we're hoping that people from around the country can come in. And one of the the phrases that we kept using as we were developing was, we hope people will see themselves, but also better understand others. So you can Good see point. things, yeah. So you can so you can see the reflections and impressions that maybe reference like, oh yeah, my grandma did that, or that really feels like my family tradition. Um, but that you can also see something that maybe is totally different to you, and you never thought about that before, and you can better understand somebody else. What did you learn in the last 10 years in regards to the uh, groups coming into Lowell? Do you have a specific, like, Afghanis? Or, uh, in so uh, we did try to feature um, some of the more modern stories, especially people immigrating from West Africa. Um, it, the, it's really interesting with the Afghani story, and because um, we've had some folks be settled in Lowell just in the last, I think, two or right. three years, um, they are not featured in the exhibit yet. Oh, okay. But we have des one of the really important parts that the community said to us was, "You need to design this exhibit so that when it opens, you can still update it." Right? We don't want it to happen what happened in the old exhibit where it was developed in 1984 oh, and then it, the timeline literally okay. stopped. So there's a few ways that we can do that. Um, we are a really important component in the exhibit is a story booth where people can go inside and share their stories and answer some questions so they can answer what challenges have you faced when adjusting to a new place or how do you build community? Um, what, how do you express your culture? And then we can take those videos and we can push them into the exhibit because we have different TV screens. So we can push them in um, after we caption them. So that's a really important way. The other way is all throughout the exhibit, um, we know it's really important to have the physical panels, not just digital technology. Um, so we have panels that we can update and we can create new panels that go into the exhibit all the I time. See. I see. Um, there's a large African community mm -hmm. in Lowell. Yes. And they've come from different countries, Ghana, Cameroon. Uh, how do you bring that in? Yeah, so uh, we had a lot of folks kind of chat with us about their personal experiences, in particular somebody from Kenya, somebody from Ghana, somebody from the Congo. Um, and so we feature it in um, the dance. We have like a whole dance component in the exhibit, the music wow. component, um, but also That's in- That's interesting, I was gonna talk to you yeah, about that. Absolutely. Music and, and Music, dance, dance yeah. art, um, but then also in some of those, um, t the terminals, we have um, people from across Lowell's history. And so we definitely, we feature somebody who immigrated from the Congo um, in that. But there are a lot of other ways in the kind of community section of the exhibit. We feature different images from people from different cultural organizations. Um, we featured specific people who had a story kind of on the wall as well. So there are a lot of stories that fit into those themes of community, mobility, and then cultural expression. There's a lot of Congolese that have moved into law, yep. haven't they, in the last 10 years? Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, we haven't talked about the Cambodian community, which is probably, what, 25%, 30% of the Yeah, world. I forget what the exact yeah, percentage yeah, yeah. is, but it is a high percentage. Yeah. And they, again, those stories were really important. Those were kind of the last stories of the previous exhibit. That's okay. kind of where it dead-ended uh, yeah, in 1986. Yeah, because a lot of times they came in the 80s yep. and so forth. So yeah. it was really important to tell that story of why they came through the Khmer Rouge genocide, but also how are they building their lull today? Uh, so you, you were talking about the Cameroon genocide. Yep. I pontificate on that a little more. Uh, I'm in not an expert. Yeah. Know. I know, yeah. but I mean, just for the, the people to yep. understand. So in the 1970s, um, in Southeast Asia, there's a lot of unrest. And as part of that, um, the communist regime of the Khmer Rouge, you know, comes into power in Cambodia. and. My understanding, and again, not an expert, yeah, no. um, is that you know a lot of people were um, either put to death or kind of excommunicated because of their professions in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, one of the artists that we feature in the exhibit is Yari Levan. So he is a master Cambodian ceramicist who learned how to do this very specific art form in Cambodia. He was pushed out of the country, and now he lives in Lowell and. Um, he has a kiln actually down by our maintenance shop that's in partnership with um, Middlesex mm -hmm. Community College. And he teaches people now today in Lowell this traditional Cambodian art form. So um, that's one of the stories in the exhibit that we try to feature. Did you know that uh, if you wore glasses in Cambodia when the Khmer Rouge came in that you were eliminated yep. automatically? Yeah, it's 
pretty horrifying yeah. stuff. So yeah, that those stories are featured in the exhibit too. We tried to make sure that we were celebrating culture and all the beauties right. of it, but we also know that there's a lot of tragedy and pain and terrible stories that influence people's culture and how they express it. Um, so that's really critical in the exhibit. Uh, you talked about the Angkor Wat um, troop. The Angkor Dance yeah. troop, yeah. 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 Uh, explain that a little bit so people understand. Sure. In fact, I think they're at the Morgan. They That's are, the, yeah. So let's, let's talk about so that. So the Angkor Dance troop, um, I'm not sure the exact establishing year. I think, believe it's in the 90s. And actually, Tim Tu, um, who is one of the uh, founders of it came to some of our meetings and shared his stories with us. Mm -hmm. um, but the Angkor Dance Troupe is a traditional Cambodian dance troupe, and they have a huge education component where they are running dance classes for everybody from the itty bitty little kids mm -hmm. all the way up to teaching people how to professionally dance. The traditional Khmer dance forms. Um, yeah, you don't have to be Cambodian. To, you don't. Uh, no, okay, no. They, that's uh, good to know because there uh, might be some people that might be interested. Absolutely, yes. I believe that they just actually released their kind of schedule of fall classes. Okay. So I would encourage people to, you know, get on the computer, look up yeah. Angkor Dance Troupe, and yeah. see what you can do. And you don't just, I don't believe you just have to be a kid either. Um, so they're trying oh, to expand right? some of their offerings. There's still a chance for me, is that I, it? I think so. I don't know. Some of my rangers were talking about wanting to do some of their classes. Yeah. Um, so they will be there. They're in the exhibit featured um, in the form of we have one of their costumes on display in one of the mm -hmm. cases. They are also going to be performing that day um, on September 23rd. Oh, they will. Yep, to kind of open up the oh, that's event. Cool. It's Where really exciting. Exactly. So in Boarding House Park, so the plan for the day is an 11 o'clock ceremony, kind of the speechifying, if okay. you will. And then at, from noon to four that afternoon, we're just going to have performances by different groups in Boarding House Park. Um, different community organizations are going to be there with activities for families. We're going to have a bunch of activities for families. So it's just kind of a big party in the park. And you can also go through the exhibit and see that space. Um, so we're what about food? That's what I go for. I know. We, we have some challenges as the federal government with food. Oh. So we are telling people, you know, we really want you to go to our brick and mortars that are just one block away. I see. Um, so okay. there's lots of opportunities right. for food just one block away. Oh, okay. Yep. <laughs> That's that's good. I thought you might have some cultural food. I that's what, yeah, like, wait, that was the like one the thing folk that's. I, I mean, wish. Emily, yeah. You know the folk festival. I mean, we. It's have one of the best weekends of, of the year. Yeah. yeah. No, I I work at Boarding House Park, all of the folk festival, and I I sample from every single tent, and then I go over to JFK and I sample over there too. So it oh, is great. Is that, oh, yeah. oh, oh, samples. They give samples. No, out. I just mean I buy. Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> a little okay, bit from the right, year, a little bit right, from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's good. It is. Um, you were. Um, Born in Lowell, raised in Lowell? And uh, can't claim to be born in Lowell. Okay. Born in Concord, but moved to Lowell when I was four months old. So oh, okay. maybe I'm a blow-in, maybe I'm a Lowellian. I don't <laughs> know. Um, but I did grow up in the city. I grew up over in Pawtuckaville, which is right near UMass Lowell's North okay. Campus. And now I own a house in Centerville. Okay. So... Um you went to Lowell High School? I did, yeah. Oh, cool. So I get to walk by my alma mater every day as I'm walking across town. And, and uh, with that hat? and Oh, yeah. Uh, and say hi to the kids. And the, when the class, you don't walk across town during class changing time because it's literally 3,000 yeah, kids yeah, moving. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you learn the bell schedule. Oh, good. Okay. So again, explain what's happening in Lowell. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that much time. So there's the, 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 one City Many Cultures exhibit yes. coming up September 23rd from 11 to 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. And what else should we know about it? Yeah, uh, if you can't, I think that if you can't make that day, that's just the grand opening. And then we are looking at a very long life for this exhibit. Um, okay. I was joking that maybe my retirement will be taking it down. Oh, no. So, kidding. yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> wow. it's going to be up. And we are planning um, for at least this upcoming winter season to have it open seven days a week. Oh, okay. So in the afternoons during the week and then on the weekends, a little bit more extended hours. Okay. So people, even if you can't get down to the opening event, we still want you to come and experience it and maybe add your story to it. Uh, and oh, How would you do that? So uh, yeah. in the exhibit, that story booth, you can record yourself talking about some part of your culture. Um, throughout the exhibit, we have, you know, whiteboards and post-it notes and all sorts of ways that you can add to the exhibit, too. Um, so that's what we're hoping for is that people I, I, make it living. I, I know it's not a Positive thing, but I hope you you mentioned the, uh, the the cultural differences of of soldiers that were in the Korean War, the Vietnam War. I don't know that we've featured that too much, so that's a good opportunity for uh, either uh, for you to come share that story, or also, like I said, we are planning on 
printing probably about once a year a new set of panels that can go in that space. Oh, I see. Um, so that's the hope is that we really bring in. Some new